Welcome back to the Agility Transformation Podcast, where we explore ways to help agile transformations be sustainable. I'm Kelly Fiday, PhD, your host. Today is part two of my interview of my colleague and fellow agile coach, Gagan Beer Palta. He brings a really interesting combination of deep experience with agile, hardened by years of experience, but combined with psychology in very practical ways that people can use right away. So enjoy. It's such a common problem that we see in agile coaching where there's just one team or even one individual that sees the negative impact or feels the pain and the rest don't. And Dean Leffingwell has a quote which he got from somebody in systems thinking that says that, you know, optimization of the part leads to sub-optimization of the whole, which I think is so <laughs> true from a systems perspective. Um, and you know, in other words, if one team only cares about that team and not, you know, the customer or losing X million dollars a day, then then everyone's going to suffer, but they don't care because they just care about their team. So my question to you is what happened to help the whole system feel the pain that previously only that one guy felt? What happened in your model? I think, I think you know, it's, it's really important that people relate at the people level. Mm -hmm. Everybody understands pain because we as individuals have gone through different understandings of pain and, and, and people, organizations tend to separate personal and professional lives, mm. you know, very well. They like to create this, this, this invisible line in the middle, but that line is actually invisible because if you're spending eight to 10 hours a day in an office for 30 years of your life, that's your life. That's your personal life. Mm -hmm. It's not professional. So firstly that, whole thing needs to be thrown out of the window. That myth needs to go out of the window. Mm -hmm. The second thing is people, because they relate to pain, they, if you are able to create a common nexus mm -hmm. of understanding as to everybody is part of it. For this group, for example, it was about seeing their scorecard. And suddenly they realize that as an individual, I may see it and say, huh, okay, I'm not very adaptive. I'm openness to experiences really low. I'm an introvert, but so what? I know it. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, hang on. Now let's multiply that with 20 other people and say, okay, they are two extroverts. Oh, they're, they're the bosses. But hang on, you are the introvert. You are the thinker. You are the one with the ideas. So why didn't I do this? Why don't I create a system where you go and put the ideas forth and then the guy sells it across the board? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It changes dimensions altogether because suddenly people realize that firstly everybody is valuable. Mm -hmm. Secondly, everybody's you know pain is common. Third, every, nothing is good or bad. Mm -hmm. And when you when you mix it all up, it's basically like a game of chess. You're putting the right people in the right place mm -hmm. for the right action, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you get a wondrous uh, you know result. Mm -hmm. And that's what. It, now, if I go back to, you know, sports teams and, you know, I, I do a lot of studies sometimes and I do very brief studies. I won't say detail. I won't lie. But it's very interesting. The coaches which actually make a difference are the ones who've understood the strengths of the team. Interesting. They've understood where each one needs to be positioned and what time. And that's what every coach has to, has to do. It can make it look at as very manipulative. If people sometimes come back and say, oh, is that something we are supposed to do as a coach? Hell yeah, you're supposed to do that. Absolutely. I but, mean, for example, yeah. if you are a coach, coach of a, a football team or soccer, as Americans say, and you have someone who is really, really fast, you're probably not going to want to play them as goalie. Probably they're better positioned Absolutely. as a striker. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 And... And a coach will also rely that some of the players who play in the back may also have excellent striking facilities. So when do you use strike so that the ball actually goes to the guy with the fast speed? Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's, that's the game of linkage. And, and in our world where you've got developers, you've got testers, you've got people to integrate, you've got environments working, it's pretty much the same. It's just simplifying the thread so that people can actually see how the knots are. Mm -hmm. And that's the simplest takeaway for a coach. If you can show them the knots, people have the understanding to actually untangle the knots. 
what you're talking about reminds me of um, a core systems coaching skill from ICF International Coaching Federation called reveal the system to itself. Um, and I think of it as holding up a mirror to the team okay. or leadership team or organization that, that you're coaching so that they can see what's happening. Um, and then they have a, an increased ability to make decisions about it or to, to move forward where they kept you know, hitting a wall previously. Um, so, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so if someone says, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, I, I think sometimes people tend to describe it as, you know, mentoring and teaching and, and some of all people have also, I think, shared about the nine different areas and the roles you can play like a facilitator, sometimes being a teacher. And I, for one, don't like to box, you know, things into a certain dimension because human beings don't operate in boxes. That's true. I mean, think of it. If we operate in boxes, I don't think there would be any job for, for psychologists and uh, psychiatrists around the world because you could box someone and say, mm -hmm. this is how I shut your box down, right? Yeah, so so yeah. it doesn't happen because the mind is, of course, whatever we understand of it is, is, is very, very, very complex yeah. and we understand very little of it. Right. Uh, and, and, and this, this is, this is, something I like to, to extrapolate and, and, you know, some people have spoken as to the size of a, you know, good scrum team and saying, you know, seven to nine multiple interactions. And I say multiply that by your conscious, your subconscious, your unconscious and your super conscious. <laughs> and There's then, a whole lot of people on the team. You're, 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 you're a person, right? So, so, uh -huh. so you should see your lies, right? So, so the reason why I'm saying that even I was be having this conversation, it's not that I'm just saying things. There, 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 are, there are, my mind is operating, operating at these four levels. Yeah. One level I can hear very clearly, which is my conscious. Mm -hmm. And two other levels is inherent programming, which I, I don't even know. I can't even hear it because I'm just speaking right now. And the same thing you're absorbing and you're saying is it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, you know, very difficult to really put in a box and say, if I say the statement, this is the exact reaction. It's gone. That's true. We're sort of like the opposite of boxes, human beings and teams. It's incredibly complex. Absolutely. And I, I think I see this, and it's very apt for the agile world because hmm. firstly, I see a lot of words being bought into the mix, which sound exciting, but I think it confuses the layman, you know. People are talking about cognitive dissonance, are talking about uh -huh. um, linguistic programming, and then there's now people talking about VUCA. Yeah. And I think, I think we don't need all that. It's, 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 it's not required. And then people obviously talk also about a lot about frameworks. And I don't know there are people who are for the frameworks and they are anti-frameworks and all that bit is happening. I think we first need to understand the commodity. And as the commodity is the person. Mm -hmm. What is the person's need? Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think that's very simple. And and then, you know, the tip, for, like I said, of the model is the need. And mm -hmm. you'll find most people don't even know why they're doing it. Oh, for sure. Mostly it's because someone else is doing it or I was told to do it. And, you know, I said, it's great, so let me go and do it. Yeah. Um, and they said agile is better and faster. Like, really, is it? Uh -huh. who, who told you that? And then they would say, oh, we did some programs and they were really great. Oh, you're saying those programs are same like your program? Oh, no, they are new world, new age, and we are actually heritage. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the gap is, is, is <laughs> you know, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of jargon being, being positioned and, while they are great literate subjects by themselves, I think people also need to understand the depth of some of the subjects. So I, I, I think it's very important that the right education is put forward. And, and I kind of took it on myself to start to push and change some of these factors and say, you know, they, these are not something we need to talk about. Things like VUCA. I mean, what has VUCA have to do with Agile? Mm -hmm. And people have picked up VUCA because VUCA was a post-Cold War theme. 
Mm-hmm. And it has nothing to do with, you know, this. It was all about, it is a change tool by itself. And nobody talks about that. That's interesting. They decided to say that the, 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 the whole answer to VUCA is agile. So you are telling me the volatility and the uncertainty in the world can be tackled by agile. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, really, I, I mean, I mean, you know, this can get into some real political examples, but you can't. Agile is not the answer to everything. And then people say agile is a mindset. I mean, how wrong could you be? Well, why wrong? Interesting. It's interesting because as I listen to you, I can see both sides or I can see multiple sides. So now I'm curious. Well, let me ask you this first because I'm so interested in this topic. I do want to ask this question, which is um, if someone wants to try out this ThinkStack tool, mm-hmm. how would they do that? Is it publicly available and how would someone get started? So I am writing a book. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yes, and, and I had a deadline, which was <laughs> supposed to be somewhere around the end of June. But let's not go there because okay. it's, <laughs> it's, even though I, I have uh, you know rights of uh, a lot of interest from publishers to have this book out, right. um, and and they've got good demand, uh, you know, from their research, which they have done, which is a very good thing. Um, I'm yet to finish it because I, th- I think I've, I've played back on my on my times and lines a little bit. But that could be the first hand you could. The second part is a website. Uh, so I have my own website, which I designed, which was called Life Converse. And is it a great website? The answer is no. So let me remove that out of the equation <laughs> straight away. Uh, okay. but, uh, but, uh, but everything on that is mine. So so, okay. so that's, that's, that's something which I'm trying to... I, I, understood that people struggled with the, the 3D aspect of, uh, you know, understanding the thing stack. So I decided to split it open, okay. which is like an engineering speak, split it open so that people could see, oh, cool. and then they, they could pick it out. So, so that's something which I'm putting up on the website. People can have a look at it. But uh, there's also an Instagram page, which is which has some of my motivation and stuff okay. there. Uh, but that's, that's far, how far I've gone. Uh, socially with it, um, but this year I really wanted to push the metal to, to it because it's 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 got a very good efficacy rate. It's almost like ninety eight percent effective in change. It's gone through about seventeen hundred people. Um, it's ranged from uh, divorced couples to mental health to organizational effectiveness to MDs to coaching. I mean, you name it. Everybody has gone through that tool and have gone through the workshops. Uh, that they've kind of understood. Um, where it is at and how much it may impact them. Hmm. And that's something which I've been trying to bring it out because I think no matter what the kind of change is, so far as you understand the need, the tool can be used and it just helps you assimilate that that information. In fact, I've got a lot of organizations wanting to buy it Interesting. As, as their proprietary stuff uh, because of the simplicity of the way it produces stuff. And then that's something which I have held on to because I want it for the people. Yeah. And I and I believe that's that's something which people should have. So that's that way. I'm I'm very big fan of Tony Robbins. Oh yeah, and yeah. And then the, you know, I, I I want to make change happen, and I want the change to be the hands of the people. Mm-hmm. I don't want to own the change, mm-hmm. and uh, because that's not something you do. Plus, it makes you a roadblock if you own the change. <laughs> Absolutely, you become you become the bottleneck. Yeah, and yeah. you end up creating an organized structure to manage it. Right, which right. I don't want to. No, I completely understand. I'm trying to figure that out myself these days. How to <laughs> how to stop being the the bottleneck? Yeah. So um, about the book and the website, um, super cool. And are there like case studies of stories of like scenarios and how you use the tool with that particular? Um, couple or team? Uh, no, I have no. I have not evolved to that extent. I, I would be honest with you because putting cases on there can make it a little, little um, dicey. Um, yeah. Purely because people may read and say, "Oh, this sounds like me," or you know, that's and then and that's not something you that you can mix it and try to make production. it potential that could still be not. not so I think I think the the answer is is to that is is really it's there. Uh, have a gist of it. If you want more in practicality, then you have to reach out at the moment. Um, and and that reach out, it's just me. 
Um, but yes, I want to grow a steady stream of practitioners who can actually take it across and, and, and do some real world stuff and they can, they can actually feel the, the reason. So I, I did get a lot of approach from organization which gave you CPDs for this kind of course. I've been also been approached by the uh, coaching federation to, to, to take this tool oh, forward and say, right? no, why don't you yes, take it and you can become one of our professional chapters and you can run it. I have not been very open and not pursued it, to be honest, because that's not something which has been in Marada, among the many other things in Marada. <laughs> so so, mm-hmm. so I, I think I think I really have to be quite pointed about where I really want it to be there. Yeah. Because the one thing I don't want is that it gets misused. And I don't want it to be miscoded. So I think the biggest thing was to go wait for the book. Uh, so that book happens, then at least you know the interests are protected the right way, mm-hmm. and it doesn't go all over the place. Mm-hmm. And it would be like a guide for people, I would imagine. Absolutely, absolutely. So it talks about a lot about the planes. It talks about a lot about existential psychology, the metaphysical plane, and 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 it talks about examples of uh, how people have transformed just by understanding the reason of the existence. And it, it sounds very philosophical, but uh, we are philosophical beings, much or much we may not like it. Uh, and um, and while it may sound like, you know, philosophy does sound like a lot of jargon, but it is a father of psychology in many ways, of the way we think and we derive our thinking. Yes. And, and a lot of our existence, if you study, is brought about by the people around us, right from childhood, you know, at the age of three, when you start to realize uh, things and patterns, now they are usually taught by people. For example, a child learns to, I mean, you're a parent like me, a child learns to run first, walk later, but we are the one who teach them to walk first and run later. That's true. Because we were grown with the fact of, you know, you know, uh, hurt and we say, oh, if you fall, you hurt. But the hurt has nothing to do with them. The hurt is our fear of loss. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you can see how the rational behavior starts to link with the emotional and you have taken a decision already. So so it's, it's, it's a beautiful triangle which keeps playing itself a million of times in, in our head. And I, I made a statement earlier and you say, you kind of intrigued you and I said, you know, agile mindset, adaptiveness. I mean, being adaptive can be your biggest death nail because you need to understand that your adaptiveness comes from rational experiences. And if your rational experiences are flawed, then your adaptiveness is never going to work. Okay, this is like such a huge topic. And I, I like agree with you. I disagree. Like I see all these angles. But one thing it reminds me of is uh, first Darwinianism, like, you know, when species adapt, historically, in terms of, you know, the history of evolution, it's not rational. They either survive or they don't survive. So they, they either mm-hmm. breed or they die out. And so there is this adaptation. So how can you say it's rational when it seems like more of a natural process? Yes, so, so we need to understand, you know, you have, I think it's two sets being compared here. Animals, for example, the whole idea of creation of the universe and the Darwinian theory, uh, uh, if I have to take that into adaptability, for example, it's, it's all hinged around the fact you survive or you die. Right. That's pain or pleasure. That's true. Yeah. You, driven by the extreme left to the extreme right, there's nothing known as a balance point. But humans have an interesting capability. As as you go up the species chain, that you have learned to 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 uh, you know survive. I mean, humans as a race are the least adapt, least capable to survive by themselves if we're not given for the brain, which sits on top of our heads. That's true. And and, and I think. If, yeah. If you have to compare it with the entire animal species, our whole genetic of adaptability is by constant refinement. That's true. And this constant refinement has only happened through points of pain or points of pleasure. So if I was attacked by an animal, mm-hmm. I created a spear. If I was attacked by people who had spears, I created another weapon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it's quite a chain of events, but they're all driven by threat. That's the common point. Yeah, that fight. And that's that's when I say, let let's, let me give an example. Yeah. If, I, if I'm jumping into an organization, 
and this organization says, you know, hey, we've not been doing very well, and we want to create this change. You, you know, you're the Superman. You're the new, you know, new CEO or CDO or CIO, and you want to create this change. I'm not creating anything new. I'm carrying my baggage with me, my baggage Absolutely. which has a variety of tools. And I'm assuming some of these tools is what I can use. So the first thing which happens is I do what, I, what is called the show off phase. I show off my tools. <laughs> because they're new, they're glistening, and, and I assume people are not showing them. The second character of people, if you're an introvert, mm-hmm. would be the listening phase. That's the exact direct opposite of the type of people you see. There's no middle in the first three months. Okay, and, and, and that's where we need to understand that those tools are not the tools designed for that organization. And that's why I say it's very important to be adaptive, but create new paradigms around that adaptiveness. Mm-hmm. You need to understand mm-hmm. that you need to throw away the tools and create a new set of tools, mm-hmm. like a spanner with a hammer on the back. Mm-hmm. Or in the past, you may have a spanner and a hammer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that's called creating a new orbit. And that, that's where I think a lot of coaching work a lot of uh, coaches can actually help create that paradigm, create that shift. So if I'm a guy who's worked in an organization which has been really agile and just had some success, or I believe I've had success, and by the way, that's a bias by itself, right? It's really sure. bad. Of course. Yeah. Because you really can't define success. Uh, and I jump to a new organization, I come back and say, hey, in my last organization, we are really agile. So I'm going to induce agile. We need to be agile by 2021. Uh-huh. February. So I made a statement. Yeah. I expect a statement to create change. Yeah. And then there are people, right? The people assimilate that information in different ways and they try to create pockets of excellence around it. And that's, that's the way the change gets propagated. But here's the fact. I carried that out because I carried experience. So if my rational biases are already out of line, I'm actually bringing it forward to, to, to an organization which which is... Uh, going to get affected by this. So so it's really important to understand the paradigm you want to create. Absolutely. So always say design the orbit in which you want to float as a planet. And if you don't understand that, let's learn to listen and understand that because mm-hmm. culture is as basic as the ingredient to creating, you know, uh, gunpowder. And if you if you can understand that, it is to light a match and create a difference. So, so uh, that's, that's the kind of uh, stuff you need to, I think, Absorb. That's why I said adaptiveness is, is I'm actually writing an article and probably in a day or two it should be on LinkedIn, but I was just writing about, you know, why adaptiveness is your biggest failure and agile. That's fascinating. And, and part of what I hear you saying is that um, as you try to create a new orbit, one key success factor is self-awareness, becoming self-aware of your own biases and your own assumptions so that if you have an assumption that won't be beneficial to this new orbit that you're aware of it and you can adjust and adapt that if I'm hearing you correctly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, um, and I want to say, you know, one of the, one of the four points of the, the, the triangular pyramid, uh, is, is, uh, you know, mindfulness or, or oblique spiritual awareness. And I, and I put an oblique there because, it depends on the individual or an organization. And some people are not spiritually aware. They, they connect spirituality with religious priority, which is, which is, it's not in my head because you can be spiritual and yet not be religious. You know, mm-hmm. you know the two, but that's a different, uh, I think, debate or discussion. Mm-hmm. But being mindful is something organizations are beginning to talk about. A lot of coaches talk about mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like you're saying, it's very important to be aware that even though I'm running this orbit, I need to be mindful of how much of the impact I'm causing around me. Because you really can't be a bull in a china shop mm-hmm. and say, I'm designing a new orbit. Because that's a recipe for failure. But sometimes there's also a recipe of success. When, and it depends on how you want to design the orbit. But I think, I think the key point is, yes, you need to be mindful as you balance your your you know flux. It's so fascinating. And it uh, you know, I think there could be a really interesting conversation with system dynamics and working with systems. Um, so I have to go because I have another meeting, but sure. I feel like we barely scratched the surface. <laughs> this is like... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a deep topic, but it's yes. It's a deep topic, but 
it sounds like you have made it simple and elegant and resilient so that people can pick up this model and use it for the kind of shifts and transformations that they want to create in themselves and in their organizations. So um, very cool stuff. And I'm already thinking ahead of like, when can we next talk? Because we have so much else to cover. I mean, we have culture, we have neurology, we have uh, all kinds of things. So, um, and I am yeah. Guessing, yeah. Yes, yes, please, Kelly. I think whenever you are free, I think if the current is aligned, I'd be happy to um, speak more about each of the subjects. I mean, just looking at the emotional plane, looking at cognitive biases, mm -hmm. I know these, these, there are some organizations which have started to touch that service and I started to talk about cognitive biases. In fact, I, I read recently LinkedIn about a very senior HRD uh, you know, leader talk about cognitive biases, and I did a workshop in London. Uh, a few months back where I did some assimilation exercises uh, on um, cognitive biases. I, I do a game called Habubi and Kiki uh, where uh, just the sound of it, you'd be surprised how, how people related as male and female just by a shape on the wall. Interesting. Uh, and and, and you, you'd be surprised that, that that game I've played with five-year-olds has the same result as a 50-year-old. Um, and it's it's just the sharpness of the sound which which makes uh, the, uh, the the male or the female form, and, and it's very odd. But that's 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 the way cognitive biases play in our life. Uh, so sometimes when we speak to teams, we need to understand uh, that there are already a lot of biases, and there are about 27 key biases which play um, huh. straight away. And you know, it's good to rationalize and understand them. Very interesting. You know, my whole uh, doctoral dissertation was on this topic in a way, it was on hermeneutics, um, which means interpretive frameworks. And the idea is that what we see, what we think is real is who knows what we're actually seeing, but what we perceive as real is perceived through a particular lens. Like if you wear yellow colored sunglasses, the world looks yellow. If you wear purple sunglasses, yeah. the world looks purple, et cetera. And if we start to ask ourselves, you know, what are the cognitive biases that we're using, that we're having in this conversation. If we can name only one or two, we're already many steps ahead of where we were before when we were not aware of our own cognitive biases. And part of my work, um, both in academia and in the coaching that I do, has to do with not only helping others become aware of their cognitive biases so they can make better decisions, but me becoming aware of my own cognitive biases so I can be a more mindful and valuable coach. Um, and a lot of the study of hermeneutics is not just uh, how do we perceive reality through the lenses of our own cognitive biases, but how do we create reality? So we start talking about topics like the social construction of fill in the blank, you know, of what is a team in Agile, um, or it could be the social construction of gender, of um, ethnicity, the social construction of identity, um, of, of, of sexual, of orientation. Um, and so we could yeah. apply that concept of, you know, um, what kinds of social constructions are we creating that we thought were real with the capital R? We thought we're, we're just sort of given in nature, like a team goes through forming, storming, norming. Everybody knows that. Yeah. Well, maybe not. Like, you know, what are the other options? And so when you start to mention cognitive biases, I get kind of excited because it opens up the possibilities for teams and people and human beings to create other alternatives. Like what if, like a company I talked to last week, they said, well, two years ago, we tried to go agile, it didn't really work out. We want to try again. And so it's, so, you know, my first question is forget about agile. Like, what do you really want? You know, and if, if you and your colleagues bring your whole selves to work, what does that look like? Yep. Um, and what innovative possibilities can we create here as we become aware of our cognitive biases? Um, and which, and now that you're aware of one or two of your thousands of cognitive biases, which ones do you want to keep and which ones do you want to throw away? Well, maybe I'm willing to throw away my assumption that that guy is out to get me over there. You know, maybe it's possible that we 
could, that, that, that of the 2% we agree on, maybe we share a common goal and start to think in, in new directions. So anyway. Absolutely, and, and I, I, think, I, I think what you just touched upon is really important because frameworks are selling because they are mastered around the cognitive biases of people. Absolutely. And people can and, and, and that's why you see organizations coming back or leader coming and say, I want to implement safe. And why do you want to do safe? Because it's a structure. But I've got a bias towards, you know, which which right. plays a multitude of levels, which wants me to do that. And and that's that's something is it part of the scope to change? Maybe not. But if someone wants to, and that's why I said if you if you you're coming with the same set of tools. And you're assuming these tools are going to work. And I say, okay, let's design the paradigm. And you, you ask the question, yeah. forget about agile. Let's ask the real need. That's looking and exploring towards the paradigm. That's yeah. looking at a new orbit. And at the same time, the way that the human mind learns, especially adult learners, is through transfer. Like if you learn about something new, you learn it better if you can relate it to something you already know. I think that's one reason that SAFE is so popular because people already are familiar with, say, a matrixed organization, for example, or hierarchy. They look at the SAFE picture, they see four hierarchies, they're like, okay, I'm, I'm starting to recognize stuff here. And it's basic philosophical epistemology of they have yeah. categories they already have, and then they try to slot the new information into those categories. And then when we get into agile, especially into innovative product development, like lean startup, build, measure, learn, all of that, when we're trying to create, you know, what's the next Airbnb, for example, what's the next Lyft or Uber, you know, it's not a category. That absolutely. Exists. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So how absolutely. do you help organizations get there, which they know they have to get there because if they don't, they'll die because that's the digital revolution we're all living in, which is another of my cognitive biases speaking through me right now. <laughs> so I could just okay. keep talking, but, um, but I have to go. So how about this? Um, first, I want to say, I assume like everybody else, you are crazy busy, uh, a father of three girls and working full time, mm -hmm. writing a book. So I sincerely want to thank you for your time in this podcast. It's been so interesting. I know it will be interesting to many other people. So thank you. No, I, I'm, I'm privileged to, to, to get this audience. And I and there's a saying that people connect because they're designed to connect. Mm. And, uh, and some people call it under destiny. So I think we were to connect. So we connected and I'm really happy that um, I could share a little bit. And I think I'm more happy that you listened Mm -hmm. Because uh, listening is an art, which is, uh, and it's called an art because it is so less and there are not many artists out there. So, mm -hmm. so I think, thank you for spending the time. Thank you very much. I appreciate you saying that.